I want to first know, um, we were just talking about, you've grown up, you're a digitally native, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. the white paper was released when you were like 14 or 15. Mm -hmm. So how did you get into um, the payments? How did you work out that we could use Bitcoin essentially to make frictionless payments across borders. Yeah, it's a long story. I'll keep it. I'm looking at this clock right here. I'll keep it 60 seconds. But uh, I've been in Bitcoin close to, to a decade, which is crazy. I look like I'm 12. I'm <laughs> actually, <laughs> it's not that funny. I, it sucks. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I'm 28. So I've been in Bitcoin since my late teens. I got into it. So my grandfather was the chairman of the Chicago Board of Trade. My dad uh, founded and ran one of the bigger discount futures brokerages. So I was growing up in my living room, all these big... Chicago guys were building positions 2012, 2013, 2014. I knew the CME was going to build a product on this thing long before anyone else did, but just because I was eating dinner with the guys, right? And uh, so my first foray was Bitcoin as this asset. It was like this commodity, very similar to gold. A lot of those guys early on saw the asymmetry in the asset and it, its scarcity was really important to them. Uh, fast forward, my work on the Lightning Network was to help those guys out. There were two main problems with Bitcoin, call it a la 2017. So I hope I'm looking at the audience. I hope you guys are following. So this is like five years ago. The two big head of the New York Times, like Bitcoin sucks. And here's why. One was the variable amount of time it takes for a Bitcoin payment to be deemed final. It's like, it was kind of unclear. When's it going to get into the blockchain? No one really knows. That was a variable. And then the variable cost is that it was a fee market and the market was free. And so it could, the fees could hike on you. And so it was those two variables, time and cost. And so Lightning, for those that don't know, was a protocol that was designed to fix that for Bitcoin. And ideally, if you could fix the variable amount of time and the variable amount of cost for a Bitcoin transaction to be final, then a very simpler like way to phrase that is Bitcoin transactions are relatively instant and basically free, which would be a huge deal. And so the story I like to tell is I was hacking on it. I was like the fourth node on the network. There's a buddy of mine in London and we wanted to recreate the pizza transaction, like really nerdy, <laughs> right? Like just sitting in my dad's basement and I sent him a lightning payment to London with my address and he ordered me a pizza. Payment got there instantly and for free. And it was in that moment, Matt, where I was like, hold on a second. Um, <laughs> I just sent value to London in less than a second. It didn't cost me anything. There was no concept of interchange. There was no concept of T plus X settlement. Uh, what did I send? Did I send a credit liability? Did I send a promise of future settlement? It also happened to be cross border, but also a commerce payment. But the protocol we used didn't know that. And it was cash final. It would blew my mind. And I was like, this is the first innovation growing up with, by a bunch of traders uh, that the price didn't matter. If Bitcoin was $10, I would have just had to send more of it. If Bitcoin was $10 million, I would have just had to send less. But the innovation was in payments. And I started to look at Bitcoin in conjunction with Lightning as a global value transfer protocol. Visa is a protocol business. Swift plus correspondent banking is a value transfer protocol. Western Union is a network. It's a value transfer protocol. And I started looking at this thing like this thing is magic. It doesn't care if you're crossing borders. It doesn't care if you're buying pizza. It's going to get value, real cash final bearer instrument, this thing. Like, it is not credit. It is a physical digital instrument that actually travels and moves in real time. And it's going to get there in less than a second and for free, no matter where you point the thing. And that's when the last, sorry, I went way over 60 seconds. But then <laughs> two months later, I called my friend back and I said, you're going to think I'm crazy because I know we're like these libertarian anarchists, like screw the state or whatever. But we're going to redo it. But I'm going to make the payment out of my Chase account. And you're going to receive it in your Barclays account. And the innovation is we're going to be live converting dollars and British pounds into Bitcoin on Lightning and using Lightning to get the value to London. But, but by the way, in terms, so this is what Strike does also. And that's when and I founded the company is I made an instant remittance payment for pizza to London with dollars and they received it as pounds and it didn't matter what Bitcoin's price was. And I was like, v like Visa can't do that. Western Union can't do that. And it's not because like I'm like a particular genius. Like this thing is a big deal. I, I, how... Um how does the forex work? I'm just curious. In a in a uh, bigger picture situation where you have, you know, more customers, you're a grown up business, um, and someone's transferring, you know, dollars from L.A. to, uh, you know, euros in Rome. How do you know you're going to get the same forex that you would get, um, you know, over the London? Uh, 
exchange. So, you, I mean, like, Forex is really inefficiently priced. Like, the rates, like, come out once a morning. Like, I'm, like, reading the paper or something. The, like, think of a transaction. But we all know them, right? I want the same Forex that I read in the paper. And you'll, you'll get it. You'll get it. Here, here's how to think about it from a very high level. If you think about the, do, the payment from my Chase account received instantly into a buddy's Barclays account, there's three legs of that transaction. One is a BTC USD buy. There's money debited from my Chase account and converted into Bitcoin. That's dollars turned to Bitcoin. I'm buying Bitcoin, not knowingly as a consumer, but I'm trying to make a payment. And so we're converting BTC USD buy order. Okay, that's one leg. The second leg is a Lightning Network payment. There's no exchange. That's just BTC going from Chicago to London. And then the third leg is a GBP BTC sell because I'm going from our BTC. Yeah, I'm going from Bitcoin to British pounds. And so that's just like, it's just like what Coinbase does. Coinbase buys and sells Bitcoin all day. So do we. It's the same thing. And when you net out those transactions, if markets are efficient, it, I'll tell you what, if there's a problem with that rate compared to the normal Forex rate, then some like prop firm is going to just arb that until it's not. I mean, like, what are we talking about? Like, it's like, well, what if the banana to my left's a dollar and the banana to my right's ten dollars? I don't know. Make nine dollars all day till it's not. I don't know, yeah. <laughs> right? But like, I don't, I'm not genius. Now, but. one thing uh, you mentioned, um, Coinbase and a lot of the other um, crypto-related businesses that seemingly should be okay, no matter what the price of the asset is, are having problems. Mm -hmm. Maybe. It's a business-specific issue with Coinbase. They overhired, and they have to then turn people away. But in general, um, strikes should not be affected by the price. It doesn't matter to you if Bitcoin is a million dollars or ten dollars. That's exactly right. That was the other reason I started the company. It was it. It's a it's a payments business. <laughs> Bitcoin. We just use it as a value transfer protocol to do stuff other people in the industry can't do. But we're not we're not correlated to the price of the asset, right? Like. For example, working with really large fast food retailers, those are our customers. Working with NCR to enable the receiving of dollars over this thing. So in theory, a Cash App user, it could go dollars from Cash App to Bitcoin on Lightning straight into a large retailer like a Wendy's, for example. Like we empower that. Wendy's doesn't care about the price of the thing. They're getting instantly credited dollars without any notion of interchange that is fixed and announced by the Fed or by a bank consortium. So they don't like they don't have a tab open of like what's the price of Bitcoin? They don't do that, right? They don't care. It's a, it's a better payments. So and just to editorialize, I think Wendy's is clearly the best fast food at least of the three major chains. Do we all agree it's the highest quality? Sir, this is a Wendy's. <sighs> um, what about competitors. I mean, anyone could do this. Visa, Western Union, um, Barclays, they could all jump on and use the Lightning Network. That doesn't bother you? No. The thesis is that a, the network is going to be better than what we have today. Today, we have these kind of like old bifurcated, like if I walk into Starbucks with Western Union, they're going to be like, what am I supposed to do with that? And if I try and remit money over Visa to El Salvador, don't really work. You have these highly optimized digital payment networks for non-digital assets. It's very expensive. There's a lot of fixed costs. It's very slow. And I think that this one open global singular network will, all these other services will consolidate on it. So it's implied that Cash App comes on. What's the use of a network if I'm the only guy on there? It's a pretty lonely network, Matt. A according to the definition of a network, I don't even think it'd be called a network. So it's implied that, yeah, w one day before I die, my transfer my wire transfer from Chase to Barclays should be over a more efficient payment rail. And so I think what we all want is open free market competition where anyone can, it's an open standard to the transfer value. And it's very simple. Like people think like, well, you know, Visa's easier. They don't have to touch Bitcoin. Visa's not easier. It's slinging around a bunch of credit liabilities all over the place. So it's not easy. And it's, you go online, read the instructions, you implement it, and you can build the experience you want. And that's where you get inherent free market uh, free market competition, which inherently suppress, suppresses pricing, and you get to really get to the bottom of things like financial inclusion problems. Like if JP Morgan Chase can't bank someone because the only uh, way they make revenue on you is if you're credit worthy. But now if the, the value transfer standards open, people could build services for whoever they want. And if there's a real market opportunity, the market's going to find that, right? So I think it's just a better world. And the more people that come on, the better. And for a business like mine, we benefit from the network effects of that. Like Jeff, Be people are like, what happens when Amazon turns it on? Like, I don't know, probably worth 10 times more overnight, right? Like, I, I, You mentioned El Salvador, by the way. I don't know 
if it's the perfect Petri dish, but it certainly is an experiment. H how do you think that's working out? Because it, Strike is active there and, mm -hmm. ve and uh, very widely used, as are other um, you know, payment apps. Yeah, I think it's working well. I don't know. I don't know. Like, since when was, like, changing the world and, like, the trajectory of your country a homework assignment that was due in, like, three days? <laughs> like, <laughs> come on. Um, I think it's working well. Um, so. Well, it just happens to coincide with the drop of Bitcoin by, like, 60%. So. Yeah, I mean. That's why it gets a lot listen, of attention. I've been through a lot of these bear markets. This is the first one where a Bitcoin, through a, a violent bear market where everyone's freaking out, is outperforming Netflix. So, Matt, everything's dropping. What do you want El Salvador to hold right now instead? Like, right? And, like, the rising of rates crushes emerging markets. Um, so, I don't know. Uh, pick your poison. Like, the system's broken. I don't know what to tell you. Right? But you can see how people are able to use Strike in places yeah. like El Salvador, places like Argentina, so, where you're active. Yeah. So, I mean, like, we're the acquirer for Domino's, for example, in El Salvador. They're receiving payments, instant cash finality from any interoperable service. You want to use the government wallet. You want to use the wallet your cousin made in your basement. So it's like dollar to dollar using this open network. These two counterparty parties, we don't sign MSAs with them. I don't have to check their credit worthiness or their balance sheet. Um, we don't need, you know, SBF to, you know, see if anyone's like uh, unaccredited or whatever, right? Like it's just cash final, bare instrument. Um, and so, yeah, for consumers to dominoes for U.S. citizens to remitting money home. And it's really cool, too. I mean, there's no, you could remit a dollar instantly and for free. So you're talking about a lot of low-income folks where, sure, transfer-wise fees aren't that bad if you're remitting 100 grand. If you're remitting 10 bucks, it's 50 percent, right? Yeah, by the way, how does Strike then make money? I mean, if I'm able to send a dollar for free, how much do you get of it? Yeah, so we don't actually think of ourselves as like a competitive crypto app. Um, we think we're providing a premium like banking like experience for consumers where you're in our we give you a visa card we make money on that right we we offer the same suite of products we're interoperable with the card network you can make ach transfers but then we also give you this lightning network thing and we give you what yield savings accounts like all like how do how do banks monetize consumers it's the same thing <laughs> and then on the acquiring side uh it's the same thing is i can just my counter positioning like, for example, a card network's rack rate is probably 100 basis points. It's a, like, near 100% cash flow positive business for me. So I could charge a big retailer five basis points. That's all cash flow positive, right? And so I'm just doing the same financial services, just better. That's the innovation. It's not rocket science. It's just better pricing, better experience, you know, so it's pretty straightforward. I want to ask a little bit about um, the crypto universe in general. As you said, you've been in since your late teens. You've seen a lot of bear markets. It's so weird to hear someone who's 28 say that <laughs> because I normally talk to 70 year olds who say that and they're talking about the market. Um, what do you think about this crypto winter? I mean, for me, it's insane. I bought my first Bitcoin at $600 also to see yep. that it's still worth $20,000. But obviously for someone who got in at 40, 50, 60, it's painful. Um, I don't know, like the fundamentals of Bitcoin and any viable investment thesis uh, hasn't changed. And to be clear, I don't know, you know, if this is a hot take in this room, but I'm Bitcoin. I, I don't like you. Don't want me to get going on everything else. So. Um, oh, but I do. Oh, we will. All right. <laughs> so I, I think Bitcoin fundamentals haven't changed. Um, the correlation to risk assets is interesting. We don't have enough time to expand on that, but I do think. Um, like post 2008, what you saw is assets with uh, any relative fixed quantity or just you're implying a uh, non-direct relationship to interest rates start to rally on the back half of, you know, recessions and, and uh, macro environments like this. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see if Bitcoin rallies when others don't in like six to 12 months. But right now it's risk off of everything. Like everyone's scared. Um, even the T-bond market, like everything's trading terribly. But the biggest criticism of Bitcoin, other than the fact that non-believers say it has no intrinsic value, um, is that it uses so much energy to, to <laughs> mine. And I actually know your take on this already, so maybe <laughs> we don't get into it. But one of the things we talk about on our crypto show a lot is proof of work versus proof of stake. We have oh, people come yeah. on like Joe Lubin who really defend the idea of proof of stake and saying that it's going to be He's got even more stake. secure. Yeah. I know he does. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, but what's your take? I mean, Ether is a big you challenger. Disclose that to the SEC. Uh, no, it's not. 
Um, so first of all, using energy is not a bad thing, Matt. Like uh, engineering and the use of energy is implied in like the growth of humanity. You know what else uses a lot of energy? An airplane. So I tell you what, you don't like energy. Next time you and the wife go to Europe, you take a kayak, I'll fly United. <laughs> Next time you want to save and grow your family's wealth, you use the dollar, I'll use Bitcoin. Next time you wash your clothes, you hand scrape your kid's stain out of the white t-shirt, I'll use a washing machine. But when, since when was using energy a bad thing? I mean, come on, like, it's absolutely asinine and ridiculous. And as far as, it's just ridiculous, seriously. It's like, no one was like, oh, this airplane uses too much energy. But we're it's trying like, to use I less. I want to travel without you No know, one, Greta comes here, she <laughs> takes a sailboat, so. Yeah, the idea was, didn't is she get like deathly sick or something. She was not not a good experience. Poor girl, for her, but, poor girl. But a small carbon footprint. Um, no. You must care. The kids care about their carbon footprint. And even right? the carbon footprint. I mean, it, it like incentivize. It's the best use of energy. You know, like what an airplane can't do, or your washing machine. Like make use of excess energy of a waterfall. So it helps stabilize the grid. Like guys flying airplanes aren't stabilizing the grid. So it's just such an asinine, ridiculous, uninformed, uneducated opinion. Those are the kind of questions I ask. Sorry. No. <laughs> um, and uh, no, proof of stake, like, first of all, if you want an asset to have a commodity premium, which, you know, you know this room knows what that is, um, creating money can't be free. Like, well, guys, what are we talking about? Like, the fact that if a lot of people want to create Bitcoin, it becomes more difficult is why the thing works. Are you, have you lost your mind? <laughs> Creating money cannot be free. And so, like, what do you mean it's just a stake in the network? So someone like BlackRock just buys stakes in the network? It's absolutely ridiculous. And then you, you also have to account for things like the laws of physics, which proof of work does. I mean, I think what Michael Saylor, Michael Saylor calls Bitcoin property and everything else not. Um, I'm not going to comment on what the SEC should do or anything, but I think the real direct messaging there is your relationship with Bitcoin is not a liability. Okay? Your relationship with Bitcoin is not a proxy to some foundation, some team, some corporate structure, some development decision. In fact, the founder of Bitcoin, he, she, or they, might be dead. <laughs> and it's working really well, Matt. Mm. It, that's what Sailor means when it's a property. There's no liability relationship. Like stable coins, there's a liability there. It doesn't mean stable coins are bad. Matt, I own a security. It's called Strike Stock. Securities aren't bad. Building li liability relationships, like Tesla stock's not bad, but there's a liability there with Elon and the company and their roadmap and their cash balance, right? And so like proof of stake, your relationship with that asset's a liability. A stable coin, your relationship with that's a liability. In theory, what you want is a monetary asset where there are no liability relationships. That's the whole point of the thing. That's what proof of work solved that. It was, a, it was like an amazing innovation. Proof of stake, if proof of work is like, we finally got an airplane to fly, this is a, a quote of a friend of mine, proof of stake is like, we know how to make it cheaper, faster, and less carbon efficient just by not flying. <laughs> it's like, well, like, that's not like a competitor. That's just a totally different product. So, oh. sorry, I got a little animated. That's my... That's good. But we're on Jesus. internationally broadcast television. Sorry. So. <laughs> let's, let's watch the language. Um, <clears throat> I want to finally ask about, you're not going to tell the SEC what to do, but obviously payments is a business that is... Uh, highly influenced and affected by regulation, especially after um, the Durban Amendment um, and then the Fed put a cap on the amount of transaction fees. What, what can be done about that? Because you don't have the lobbying power of a Walmart or a Visa, you know. Yeah, but you might. Here's what I mean by that. So for those that don't know, Matt's alluding to post-2008, the Dodd-Frank reform where the government was like, this is ridiculous. Like the counterparty risk that a lot of these central banking actors pose to the economy is too big. Oh, whether they're right or wrong, we could have a whiskey over that, but that was what, how they felt. Then the Durban Amendment took debit card interchange away from banks. They're like, this is ridiculous. You're charging 3% to move a balance from Chase to Bank of America. There's no credit in that. There's no like cost in that. That's not 3%. And like, why are you saying that? Durban took it away from them. What ended up happening then is someone like Bank of America goes, well, I can't monetize mortgage lending anymore post-2008. That blew up, didn't it? 
I, now I can't monetize my checking accounts. So when did we start seeing overdrafts, non-free checking, and a push to consumer credit, which is a US phenomena because of this environment? This is, there are no, there's no credit card market in Europe. Uh, it was then. It was when Bank of America said, listen, the federal government took all my revenue models away. The only way I can really make money is credit cards. And then you see businesses like Chime, these are like Durban Amendment arbitrages, which it's just a checking account and debit card that routes under the exemption of $10 billion worth of assets, right? And so what I think in my messaging to the Durban office, I had the pleasure of speaking with them, is kind of like put the guns down. Like federal overreach, what we really want is an open, true, fair marketplace. We want an open value transfer protocol where Square and Bank of America and Chime can all compete on getting money to Wendy's fairly. And that's it. And so when you say Walmart and Bank of America is not on your side, maybe they are. That's the power of an open network. And I think if you want true price suppression and you want true open market competition, you, 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 if you were to rebuild Visa, you would do it just like the Lightning Network. All the banks would be independent nodes that are on a distributed payment rail, and everyone's open to compete on how to sling the value between each other. And the value has to be property. There can't be a liability in there. Like, what if someone seizes the stable coins in the bank? What if the, someone on the foundation of the founding team of the token goes through a divorce or something? It's like independent of any liability, and that's how it's cash final value escrow, and let the free market compete for experiences on the acquiring and the issuing side or the remitting side, the global payment side. That's my take. And I told Durbin, I don't know if federal overreach is going to solve this. I think a free open market, like lightning may be the most American thing we got at solving this problem.